Madison, what was the flight like back on the way home? The flight itself was like a regular LL flight, but the airport was totally nuts, like mm. a mob for six mm. hours, like the people fighting in line. It was really, I don't know, it was it was a lot on the nervous system. Hmm. Yeah. And I and it, <clears throat> you know before that, I mean, you were in Israel for quite some time and doing some pretty amazing stuff with your dad and uh, spending a lot of time in spot. What what was yeah. that trip like with him? Yeah, my dad hasn't been to Israel in fifty years, and hmm. the last time he was there was living on a kibbutz for a few months before going to India for the first time. Hmm. Uh, and so, you know, I, he said it was really cute. He's like, I made one mistake 50 years ago and that was that I left Israel. So it kind of like goes to my suspicions and points that I make in a lot of my writing that if my dad hadn't gone the way of, um, of the Ramdas India thing, I think he would have like been part of that whole like Israeli Balshuva hippie movement in the mm. 70s. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I took, you know, I basically got there like a month and a half ago, at least early September and um, took my dad on like a trip. Like I really just wanted to show him Israel because he, has, he hasn't been in so long. And then he left and I was there for the rest of the Chagim. And I mean, he was there for Rosh Hashanah and then he left right after. And then, yeah, I was there in spot mainly for the rest of the time. For the Chagim and uh, yeah, getting out of spot was the the day that I left was the day that spot finally started having its own sirens and so hmm. like there were like sirens going off and I was about to drive down to the airport and I was so scared I was like do I just not go like what <laughs> like I didn't want to be driving around alone when there were you know they were like saying like people were flying in and paratroopers and suicide bombers from Hezbollah like I was just anyways then it turned out to be a false alarm but like. Yeah, that plus the airport, plus just like coming back to America where everyone's also hysterical has been a lot of, I don't know, still hmm. trying to catch my breath. Hmm. Well, it seems like you've uh, you've landed pretty softly here in uh, Krishna Das's basement of all places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank God. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I've always so struck you know, when we first met and talked and have gotten to know you um specifically about how much your parents lives and you know the things that they found to be meaningful important and relevant um like many of us but maybe like more so for you um that just gave you like a profound foundation about spiritual life and for striving for wisdom and teacher and community sangha um and for uh, you know peak experience in practice and bringing it back down like could you talk a little bit about who your parents were before you came into the world yeah yeah so um i write about this a lot in my book especially part one um, but you know, both my parents come from pretty traditional Jewish households. My mom is from New York, so she's like your basic like New York Queens Jewish American princess. And my dad is um grew up in l a. My grandfather actually was like a m immigrant from Belarus and had founded a couple shuls in the hmm. San Fernando Valley, North Hollywood area. Hmm. And what um, shuls are those? Do you know? One of them was called like Rodef Shalom and the other one is called the People's Synagogue. I don't remember. It was like one of them was like Dafka free, like so that you wouldn't have to pay any membership wow. or something. Hmm. Um I don't I don't know. They probably don't exist anymore. My dad's my dad's 82, so you know, it's a long, long time ago. Um, so yeah, so both my parents grew up in like sort of more traditionally like post-Holocaust Jewish homes and um, they were both rebels in their own right. Um, my mom was just sort of like a flower child, you know, doing acid and mescaline and whatever, tripping in upstate New York and Greenwich Village. And my dad, um, my dad basically had a slightly different 
he had a harder upbringing his brother who was like a torah scholar and Hmm. suspected gay uh, man and genius and whatever had died right after my father's bar mitzvah Hmm. so he like trained my dad everything and then passed away from leukemia and so my dad went every day to shul with my grandfather to say kaddish for a year and then six years later my grandfather died and my dad went to shul every day to say Kaddish again for his father and no one at the shul was particularly warm to my dad and he just felt like so much like what is this community and was really turned off to Judaism it's like he was looking for answers like life had no meaning you know his brother died and then his father died and like he was going he was turning to religion for solace and not getting it there and it basically like sent him off and he was like fuck Judaism like I'm done um and really he was really mad at, at god and i think to be mad at god means that you really have to believe in god <laughs> you know you're in a relationship with god um mm-hmm. and so he ended up becoming a lawyer um specializing in marijuana cases especially like in the 60s when that was very you know like it was a, it was a good <laughs> line of business to go into uh for criminal defense and ended up um retiring feeling like life was um meaningless and he wanted to figure it out before he got too old so around 29 he took a sabbatical and went to India and um, there he met he accidentally met Ram Das, who was the author of Be Here Now and Ram Das led him to meet their guru named Kurli Baba or Maharaji and that really gave my dad I think the meaning that he was looking for and had also not hadn't found in Judaism so what do you mean by what do you mean by when you said accidentally found Ram Dass. so yeah so my dad also wrote a book it's not out yet but it's also a memoir like we all it's funny because my sister published a <laughs> memoir like a couple of years ago and then my dad's been working on one and now I've just published one so you just read all three stories and maybe you'll have like the truth about my family yeah it would be a box set this is amazing the, the Margolin <laughs> uh, memos or yes, something exactly so um what I mean by accidentally is that my dad was seeing this psychiatrist. He thought he was crazy, right? He's like, he wanted to quit his job. He's like a super successful lawyer. He was like, this not has no meaning, but let me talk to a therapist first and make sure I'm not crazy before I go on a mm-hmm. sabbatical. And the therapist gave him a number of books to read. And among them was Be Here Now, which was, had just been released. And the therapist basically said, he's like, I know where you're going. I just wish I was going with you. You know, it was kind of like, you know, foreboding words. Jeez. And so my dad did a Vipassana retreat with Goenka, at like a silent meditation um, in India. And Goenka said to him, if you run into Ram Das, like tell him he's a great teacher. And my dad's like, what? Like, what do you mean if I run into Ram Das? Like, why would I randomly, like, why would I run into Ram Das? What are you talking about? And then he was in Delhi at a hotel and he's looking at the like list of, um, I guess back in the, this is like the early seventies, there was a list of all the hotel residents and Ramdas, the name Ramdas was on the list. And again, Ramdas is like John Smith. Like it's not like the most, um, you know, specific name, but anyways, um, my dad left a message for Ramdas from Goenka. And then he got in some Ramdas decided to invite him up to his room. Um, and so at that point, my dad, like, that's what I mean by accidentally. And so he, and this is all by serendipity and he, ends up in Ram Dass's room and it's like there's incense and pictures of the guru and um you know basically my dad's like wow my like I accomplished what I need to accomplish here in India and Ram Dass says no absolutely not he's like anything you see in me is a reflection of Maharaji like you have to go meet the guru immediately and so he sent my dad to Vrindavan no yeah Vrindavan um to the ashram there Maharaji has a couple of ashrams and that's where he met the guru for the first time and they became lifelong friends and you know the whole community of people who had spent time with with Neem Karoli Baba are all very much like family to each other and when did he finally meet Sherry my mom um he met her in I guess like 1990 or something like like not long before I was born and um she was in California had like chased an ex-boyfriend out to the west coast and they got caught in the turnstile at the gym and he like followed her out or she was like, do I know you? And he, he was like, maybe. And she's like, are you from New York? And he's like, no. She's like, okay, then I don't know you. 
she did and he's like no 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 wait 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 and so that's how they that's how they met well yeah. it you know it it sounds like a uh it sounds like almost every other Neem Karoli Baba story, right? Like like you mentioned, serendipity, Hashkacha Pratis, um, this idea of, you know, things not, you said accidental, and that's why I actually, you know, I, it struck interest in me because these things turn out to like never be accidental when you're around the guru or it's a circle of the guru, um, or that, you know, these things were, uh, divinely inspired or providential so you know, all of Maharaj kind of grace. say again in the satsang they'll say by maharaji's grace which is yeah. how they talk about serendipitous events hmm. so your you know your father seems like if i'm thinking about this like strands of dna i can see cannabis i can see torah raising shuls um, deep commitment to practice and family. Like, what's the other side of the DNA strand of your mother that you know eventually becomes uniquely you? Um, uh, Jewish neuroses and like, like the classic Jewish anxiety trip that you know my mom is like, well, like if you if you've seen the nanny, um, mm -hmm. she's like sounds like Fran Drescher, or if you've seen Curb Your Enthusiasm, I've Green talked Man. I've talked to her on the phone. Yeah, she's like the nanny on a good day. And, and I say like Susie Green from Curb Your Enthusiasm on a bad day. And she <laughs> she's just like totally loud. And um, she's like a true New Yorker. And um, but she smokes a lot of weed, which is good. It really chills her out. And she's a yoga teacher. And, you know, I write about this in my book where, you know, I have this like, you know, I really, you know, I, it's very clear how much I've been influenced by my dad. You know, my work is, you know, very much in line with it, it reflects mm -hmm. influence. And my mom, um, you know, she's really the one who's like been, you know, like with like my parents are divorced and I talk about this a lot in my book, but, you know, she she's really been more present than my dad for most of my life. I mean, maybe that's just how it turns out when you have divorced parents and you're, you know, you're you end up with the mother more more often. But, you know, she would say things like your body's a temple or kind of try to drop these little pearls of wisdom. And I always rejected it as a kid because I was like, you go from one minute screaming at me and the next minute you're teaching yoga and like put on that soft voice. And I couldn't like take it seriously, like anything she had to say. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, just in a more on a more serious note like my mom does care both my parents have their own kind of anxiety but like you know like eating disorders and anxiety and inherited trauma and like all the women in my family have some sort of disordered eating situation or have had that and you know when my mom would say things like your body's a temple and I would really reject it it's like I rejected it so much because I needed so badly to hear it um, and to like treat my body well, especially as a teenager when I was specifically not doing that, um, you know, starving myself, which I guess is in line with like Tisha B'Av and temples and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so so my mom is, I don't know, I think her influence really comes from just like trying to be a really good person. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the idea of... Um... You know the 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 healing the the medicine even um existing before the affliction came to mind yeah. so yeah yeah and you you talk about your um your history with an eating disorder and i was actually kind of like amazed by how it, it the, at least the way that you narrated in the book it kind of like resolves very quickly um like you are at UC Berkeley, you start getting involved with the Jewish community, um, and things just kind of shift quickly. Was that was it that quick, or did something yeah. else change that you just no. weren't able to put in there? I just needed to get out of my parents' house. Like, I hmm. think you know, I had this like this eating disorder was like taking over my life. Like, I would weigh myself like fifteen times a day. I was, you know, in high school, I was running on the cross country and track teams. Like you know, like my whole self-worth, even though I was a straight A student and had all these other reasons to, you know, maybe feel good about myself. Like I'd based my self-worth on how skinny I was and how much I weighed. Um, whatever, Beverly Hills High School, 
like growing up in a family with stepsisters and half sisters and kind of the competition there and and all of that type of thing um but I I did there was just one day where I decided like I'm never weighing myself again um and that was I think my sophomore year of college even when I got to college I just stopped caring like I was so much more involved with living life and I was excited to be in Berkeley and I was doing mushrooms for the first time and I was just like fully alive and yeah, I just, there was like a moment where I was like, I don't weigh myself anymore. And I think that was in 2010. And I have not weighed myself since like, I just cold turkey didn't do it. Um, hmm. Even when I go to the doctor, I'll say like back to the scale. Um, and maybe that's a sign that like, I'm still not fully healed if I don't want to weigh myself, but um, I don't miss it. Hmm. And I never thought twice about it after. Hmm. Did your first experiences with mushrooms at Berkeley, do you, I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, and also, like, was that, were those healing moments for you explicitly? Or was it more like excitement, fun, creative? Um, were, were there inklings of like a, a healing path in there yet? Or did that not come until much later? I don't think I thought of it as healing. Like also keep in mind the narrative back then was still much different than it is today. And not that mm -hmm. like there wasn't a history of, of psychedelics being used for mental health, but like my intention for going into it was very much the intention of like a psychonaut. Like I just was so curious about this plane of consciousness and I really just had to experience it. And I was like, I had done all this research. I wrote a I wrote a research paper on psychedelics before I even tripped for the first time. And it's like as if you're reading a guidebook to Paris and then you go to Paris, you know, it's like the same idea. And so I knew I did know going into it and I knew after as well that it was extremely sacred and that it was like I never thought of psychedelics as like a party drug, even though I ended up taking them in, you know, those types of environments here and there. But I, I like I was especially in the beginning, really like cautious and um, realized that it was a spiritual thing. And I think that was my impulse for wanting to explore it. And I think also having it framed through like, the Ramdas context, put the spirituality at like the head of the carriage, you know, like that was leading my my impulse toward mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. Was there ever like in in the background of those early experiences given that you know Ramdas is in your mother's milk he's you know held you on his lap when you're young like all of those messages where he comes out of psychedelic experience and with Maharaji um you know kind of like graduating from psychedelics were there any was there any sense in you like like, why am I doing this? It seems like this is, you know, uh, you get to go into the, to the room, but you don't get to stay or. Did, did yeah. You know? My first mushroom yeah. trip, actually, my first mushroom trip, I was with my older sister and two friends. Um, I was, I was 18 years old. It was like winter break from my first semester after college or after my first semester in college. And mm -hmm the family medical marijuana doctor who was a former Orthodox Jew gone, like, I don't know, gone hippie. He was, he was, uh, he, he trips at us with my older sister. And it was the, probably like one of the most, maybe the most significant day of my life still. And I, I remember like sitting on the beach or in Venice beach and it's sunset and there's a drum circle and it's like something out of like hippie dream world. And I said, Oh, be here now. I get it. Like, and I was just so still and so okay. And like, just so like, everything gelled in that you know on that trip in that moment there was another thing I said like I got cold and I was like I'm shivering but it's not me my friend was recording everything I said and um but later as I was coming down I started to get sad it was and I remember thinking like I don't want to have to need psychedelics to feel what I felt today and I was like and again maybe that was the Ramdas trip coming through but like I really, from the first day that I ever tripped or did psychedelics, I really wanted to be able to sustain that level of spirituality and stillness and connection just like naturally. Well, you know, I'd love to obviously hear about your direct experience. I think having read 
some passages from your book and obviously all of the writing um, that you've done before this, I think there are moments of intensity in your writing where, you know, if it's gonzo journalism or however you describe it, stream of consciousness, like you're really talented at um, bringing in a massive amount of um, of sensory awareness and experience into very short um, passages, like the way that you describe being in Israel for one of the first times, like living that that life, um, right? Very intense. Is are your psychedelic experiences that intense, or were they earlier and things have changed, or is it just like a style of writing, like when you get into a certain rhythm where like that intensity, that level of detail comes out quickly. So funny because I didn't notice it was intense. I think my life is intense. I really mm -hmm. do. I think I I think I am constantly experiencing a lot of intense stuff at once. And you know, just like again, if you just look at the past month of my life, like I came to Israel, was like on a trip with my dad, and then in the Chagim, and then in a war, and then like like the sirens are going off and then I'm like in the airport and then I'm I literally land and go straight to a fundraiser and like shower mm -hmm. there and like put mm -hmm. on a smile and give a speech and the next day sign books at a conference and like crashed over Shabbos and and repeat right like like it's just all but I feel like for whatever reason, like God has like thrown me into these situations. I don't want to like victimize myself, but there are circumstances out of my control that have been intense. I feel like that's always kind of what I'm used to. And so my psychedelic, I have always thought that like every time I trip, I'm acting more high than I am <laughs> or like people hmm. don't realize how high I am because I also like, I'm a little bit subtle. Like just, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not like, I don't make a scene out of myself usually, I hope. So I'll, I remember when I was really young and I'd be tripping, I'd be like, you guys don't understand. Like, I'm really, really high. Like, I want someone to sort of just like be with me or, or like hold my hand a little bit. And they'd be like, you're totally fine. You're like, no, no one would even know that you're high. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm feeling it really intensely and no one's taking me seriously. Hmm. So I don't know. I guess that's kind of common <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, you know, I as a writer, obviously, and just hearing about your direct experience, that's so important. I'd love to go back to even just talking about your um, notions of the sacred and the spiritual in those experiences, like, you know, as high as you are. Um, your book is also, you know, your story, the way that you have put it together. Um, this, like, question that you, you, you end one particular chapter with, can you have a Jewish experience with psychedelics? Um, and that's a question that has motivated your life's work and continues to do so. Um, like, where are you holding right now with all of this? I, I mean, I know the obvious answer, we talk about this constantly, but like right now in the middle of a war, um, you know, in the middle of just like where we are in space and time, Roland Griffiths, uh, who was the lead researcher at Johns Hopkins. Um, you know, they just created a chair for, uh, what they call it, secular spirituality. Um, you know, you're all about like layering time on top of itself um, also. And even tomorrow night's like the yard site of the Pia Zetzner Rebbe. So like putting all these threads together, where are you holding with whether you can have a Jewish experience with psychedelics and what that even might be like. Yeah, I mean, absolutely you can. Um, you know, it was sort of in the beginning of that inquiry, I I mean, I had done psychedelics at that point, right? Like I had my trip on Venice Beach, like all my Berkeley stuff, whatever. And I didn't characterize it as Jewish, even though I always felt really, really Jewish. Like I, not like, like it wasn't about from kite or anything I just was always hyper aware of my Judaism even as a kid like I and again having done certain like past life work and trauma work whatever I think I probably uh, was in a body that was in the holocaust like as my mm. my whole whatever but like 
Like I was like obsessed with Holocaust literature as a kid and was like, do I look Jewish enough to be targeted? Like I'd ask my mother these questions. I'm like, do I need a nose job? Like really? No, like, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but I, I would ask those questions. No. And um, I, so I guess I'll say like, I have been able to like articulate this more maturely and explicitly over the years. And so I am you know, like C.S. Lewis says, like, you're not a body, like, you're not, you're a soul, you're not a body, you're, like, you're a soul in a body, right? But you are the soul. And like, I think through my psychedelic work, and also through dancing and yoga, and prayer, I've, I really associate as my soul. And I know that my soul is in a body and my soul is in a Jewish body. Hmm. And maybe like, according to some, like, maybe you could say I also have a Jewish soul, like the flavor of my soul is Jewish, for sure. But I'm just like aware of like the way that I move through the world is as a Jewish person, regardless. And so anything I do is Jewish because I'm Jewish. And it's like, and it, maybe it's because I also like, really, that's like my orientation, especially at this point in my life, where it's like, at you know, especially Judaism is, it's a religion, but it's, it's not just that it's a lifestyle, it's a way of breathing, it's a way of like relating to yourself and God and nature and community and it's like Judaism comes up at every moment of life like you wake up and you say moda'ani like you you drink water and you say blessing you know if if that's what your practice is right um and so it's not just like you something you do in shul and like wash your hands of at least for me so <laughs> at this point yeah like any psychedelic experience I have I relate to it as part of my relationship with God and I do feel like the flavor of my relationship with God is Jewish and a lot of the language and framework that I, you know, I, I, I bring Jewish books with me or I, I do practices that are talked about in Judaism, like his Deuce, which is like a, you know, one-on-one -on -one chat with Hashem. Um, but in the beginning, when I first reported on this, I thought someone, I interviewed someone about that question, like, can you have a Jewish experience with psychedelics? And he gave me the answer I was looking for and that I realize is not the point, which is that when he trips, he sees Jewish stars. And I'm like, that's, oh. you know, I'm like, there you go. Like, of course, like the star of David in like psychedelic patterning. Great. Perfect. That's what I wanted to quote you on in this article, but it's so much deeper than that. Right. Like it's mm. so much more about like your embodiment and sense of self and soul. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm asking about, obviously you know, your memoir and your your own um your own uh, your own unfolding but what about for other folks and you've met so many jewish psychedelic um people um who don't in, who don't like connect still don't connect with hashem or ritual and they're still seeking that that question you know whether it's like your advice or things that you've learned or um, gained from other people further down the path, like, what would you say to them? Can you have a Jewish experience with psychedelics without like that, the entire package of Jewish spiritual practice, wisdom, orientation toward divinity as reality? Like, what we, might you say yeah. to them? Like, at this point, I don't need to set my intention for it to be Jewish, though there were points in my experience, too, where I would say my intention is just to be in Shabbos. And like, can mm -hmm. I feel Shabbos? And I would specifically do it on Shabbos for a variety of reasons. For someone who isn't as involved or feeling connected to that part of themselves or, you know, whatever, just like a an American person, regular American who happens to be Jewish, right? And goes to shul once a year or never. Like, I would still say, okay, well, if you want to connect to your roots and you want to, like, it's part of your intention to explore that aspect of yourself then here are some practices that you can do to incorporate that, that to incorporate that, whether it's in the preparation stage of a psychedelic experience or to have while you're tripping, like, you know, just music or a particular book or, you know, whatever it is, there are elements that you can bring in that, that can speak to this if that's something that you're intentionalizing. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that you, the way that you framed it from the C.S. Lewis quote was about having a Jewish soul. I, I wonder if there's also something about having a Jewish body. You know, maybe maybe someone who is not on the Hashem path 
um, might not connect with the idea of soul, spirit, but you know, it, it's undeniable that we live in Jewish bodies. We are born into Jewish bodies. We die in Jewish bodies, um, regardless of our observance. Um, like, what's what's your connection now? And this is going back to you know, your history with eating disorder. Like, where are you in your Jewish body and connecting that to your psychedelic experience also? Yeah, so I'll say that I never, I think I wrote this in my book, but I really woke up to my Jewish body, quote unquote, when I did 5-MeO-DMT. Mm -hmm. um, and that was after I'd already started doing like ayahuasca with Hasidim and like I would be in these ayahuasca circles and they're singing Nigunam and it felt like it was Shabbos and it, it had all the fixings, like the external factors of this is a Jewish prayer experience. But when I did 5-MEO DMT, I was, and I was not in Brooklyn, I, this time I was like in California, I was with these two guides, neither one of them were Jewish. Like it was a very explicitly secular setting, like nothing about spirituality or Judaism especially. And I felt almost like, I don't know, like, I don't want to say misunderstood, but I was freaking out. I like especially with 5-MEO you you like you like your ego like your mind you disappear you don't exist and it's really what's left is your body and it's like okay so now your body is like on auto like what's your body doing without your mind directing it and mine was freaking out like I was hmm. completely anxious and my nervous system could not relax and I was hyper vigilant and immediately like especially I think also in contrast to these like very serene nice like gentile guides I was like have you dealt with someone like this before and like maybe they have it's Los Angeles but like it I I felt like it was like so much like Jewish neuroses and anxiety and spilkes in my body and it had nothing to do with my mind or soul or anything it was just like this is how my body operates and it really woke me up to like that level of somatic like based fear that I live with and I realized like how much fear I carry like I like my body has just it's just like riddled with fear and or has been and it and like I think I needed that like it was like really gave me more of a body awareness in the absence of any sort of like mental sensation with the 5-MEO mm -hmm. and at, at that point is when I really started to like just notice like what I was like I, I don't know like I instantly put it together like this is like this is from my mother like she's also very like I, thank god I don't think I have as much fear as I did before um but but yeah um it it just I was like this is a Jewish thing and I knew it wasn't all mine <laughs> and mm. so yeah well as uh you know, one of the most storied reporters on the beats of Jewish psychedelics, I'd be interested to know and learn, like, what are the, what are the most important um, movements, moments, um, happenings that are happening uh, in the Jewish psycho psychedelic world right now that I, either you put into your book or things that have not made it into the book, but are, um, most exciting, interesting, um, and also maybe like what are the most concerning things? Like what what do you have? Uh, what do you have some concerns about in this world too? I have concerns about integration, and I have concerns about psychedelics like being seen as like the answer. Hmm. It, you know, I really want to, and Ken Kesey talked about this a lot too, um, where it's like, what are you doing to go further? Right, like psychedelics are not about psychedelics. Like psychedelics are about everything else that you come to under the realization of the consciousness that they help you access. And can we use the psychedelic ethos to tackle questions of policy, conflict resolution, environmentalism, medical systems, like th the war in Israel-Palestine? Like, like there's, you know, I, I've been doing a, a story on the Israeli-Palestinian ayahuasca circles and the, the truth of the matter is that not everyone, most people in the region are not going to be doing psychedelics with each other or at all. And so it's like, what is the point? Like, this is, you know, like, where is it all going? And then I also started interviewing um, uh, people living in the West Bank, like Jewish, Israeli settlers um, about 
their psychedelic experiences and messianic consciousness and whatever and one of them said to me and he was it's funny because like he, he apparently his perspective is more aligned with like the perspective of the Palestinians who I was interviewing than with like the mm. liberal like Tel Aviv people um but he said like psychedelic thinking is being able to hold multiple truths and allow them all to be and like it's true that Judea Sumeria the West Bank whatever you want to call it Palestine is is the is a Jewish homeland and it's also true that it's the homeland of Palestinians and there's all these truths that I think require expanded thinking that go beyond the binary um, that that require psychedelic thinking in order to really allow to be and then to to engage with um, and to really think beyond the parameters of how we've been thinking of this issue now again I'm not there's like I have concerns about like being like this is this war is a problem of consciousness and spirituality which it is but also the tachlis of like people are dying left and right and like what who cares about psychedelics right now um so my concern is again like just like not integrating psychedelic consciousness as changing the systems that we're that we're needing the psychedelics for um as far as what's going on in the Jewish psychedelic world I think that's the question, right? Yeah. Seeing, yeah. So what I'm seeing, I guess, is is um I think more like explicit articulation of a movement that wasn't as well crystallized before. And I mean, granted, like Judaism has always been psychedelic. Um, if you read Magic of the Ordinary by Gershon Winkler, I think required reading really for anyone interested in this type of stuff. You know, it's like, what is psychedelic if not an experience that connects you to your soul and to God and to nature and to community and the stars and directions and whatever. And so that book really woke me up to like this sort of tribalistic nature-based components of Judaism that in and of itself feels like the results of a psychedelic experience and is a practice that harnesses psychedelic consciousness and enables us to engage with that from the perspective of engaging with nature. You know, and then we see that also with the Baal Shem Tov, and like this kind of like direct relationship to God. And I think a psychedelic experience or a, an experience, a direct experience of God, God itself, himself, herself, whatever, themselves is also psychedelic, right? Like God is also like, God is psychedelic. Um, and so there's all these components of like that Judaism is, is has been, will be, always is psychedelic. Reb Zalman obviously um is like one of the first people to put that into like more stark relief and then the you know then we had people like Yosef Needleman um whenever he wrote Cannabis Hasidus I guess 15 years ago at this point that was like one of the more modern books that started to like like dig at this question and then a lot of the work that we've been doing you know through Jewish Psychedelic Summit through Shefa you know the fact that Shefa exists I think is like hitting the nail on the head because Nowhere in the medical community or the psychedelic community officially or the therapy community or the research community or whatever, has there been Jewish directed uh, um, like a Jewish directed platform and, and place for people to go to. And so I think it's huge because there are so and what Shefa is doing is like for the people who are not necessarily on the same wavelength as Yosef Needleman or myself or who or yourself or whoever but are like oh I'm Jewish and I'm into psychedelics I didn't know that I could put this together and like now there's a place where they can start to engage with that um aside from all that stuff there's you know in the Hasidic world and I write about this a lot in my book there's a lot of plant medicine ceremonies happening um a lot of you know like individualized psychedelic sessions a lot of psychedelic side trans parties and ketamine use like it's it's rampant um and yeah and in israel too and um you know i think there are the communities that have just been ultra influenced by psychedelic substance and by psychedelic consciousness and you see the reflection of that in places like uman or in places like spot or in places like bat ayan you know like so yeah, that's those are sort of the places that are kind of innately and inherently of that consciousness, I guess. Well, with the just the last few minutes that we have together, um, I think there's a 
persona that looms very large in this book. Um, and that's Rabbi Nachman of Breslov um, in so many ways and lots of different pages and places. And I'd love for you to, to end our conversation today. Like, how did you get to be so enamored with this Rebbe? Um, and like, what's a fundamental teaching of his that you um, are holding and want other people to know too? Yeah, I don't know how I got so obsessed with Rabbi Nachman. Um, I saw Jessica Tamar Deutsch the other night. Um, she's an amazing illustrator. She has a book coming out on the law. It's an illustrated book of the Lost Princess, which is one of Reb Nachman's fairy tales. And she described herself as a Rebbe Nachman fangirl. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly that's that that's the that's it. That's what it is. Um, I think I discovered Breslov in Israel, like um, through the Nanach trans buses, like through, like, I was just like, what, what is this? And I, they just gave me so much joy. Like, I thought it was so cute. Like these, these Nanach people. And for those in the audience, like Nanach is a certain sect of followers of Reb Nachman, who they go around in these Mary Prankster colored vans and blast music and stop in front of a shuk or at a stoplight and just dance in the streets. Um, they have like long flowing payas and white linens and white yarmulkes and I was just like this is so cute and cool and what is it and I was I was so young I was probably like 19 or something when I first started to like get consciousness that this was a thing and then I um like I, I dated someone whose sister is Nanach and I got to spend time with them in Israel with her family. And like I was like, I saw the other side of it, which wasn't the crazy nanachs in the street, but just like a really simple, sweet, loving family that you could tell like had some sort of spiritual sustenance that was like infusing their daily lives. And it was so beautiful to me that I was just like, okay, like what, who's this Reb Nachman figure? Like he's clearly like behind this <laughs> in some way. Um, and I I just like based on the people as I've been hanging out with, they all sort of would drop some Torah here and there from Rabbi Nachman and um someone like some angel off Instagram who remains anonymous, like sent me a set of Likute Maharan. <laughs> and, you know, I've just been like reading it and I, it turns out like a lot of close people to me have all been influenced by Reb Nachman. And so I learned kind of in this folk way about Breslov and then started being more serious about it because I was every time someone said something that was based off Rabbi Nachman, I would be like, oh yeah, that's exactly it. And then I, you know, I learned about Uman and everything. So, and Sfat, I also re recognize that so much of Sfat, which I fell in love with the minute I met the place, um, so much of the vibe there is influenced also by Breslov. So one of, I guess what Reb Nachman, I mean, he has says so much that it really resonates with me, but there's a lot, I think there's like a quote in the book that I use First of all, there's first, I mean, I guess there's two that like really stick with me. And it's like one is that or three. One is his whole thing is like the biggest mitzvah is to be happy. And like sometimes that can be a little bit sound a little bit spiritual bypassy. Um, you know, it's like you have an issue. And it's like just be happy. And it's like the same way my parents be just be here now. And I'm like, I can't, you know. But I think it's more like. Hashem is to be found everywhere and it's like even like your lowest lows are just ammunition for your highest highs and I think of it like pulling back an arrow to like the furthest back it can go and that and really like the further you take it is like it has the most um what's the word uh kinetic energy or whatever to like to to shoot the farthest right and so Reb Nachman's whole Hasidus is based on the idea that like you're never too you've never fallen too far from God and you can find God in even the most heartbreaking of scenarios and even Dafka and the most heartbreaking of scenarios is where you have the greatest potential to connect. Um, and I think for people who have been through a lot of trauma, like that's a very promising, comforting thing. You know, the other part is um, he said something along the lines of like the most important thing is to be happy, but more important is to be free. And the way that I understand it is that if you require anything at all in order to be happy, then you're not really free. So like they're kind of intertwined. And so a lot of that is 
harvesting like your own like for life and like finding that in yourself and again like it's taken I've had to do that so many times in my life um Reb Nachman also talks a lot about dance and breath and like those are huge things for me just in general and um the last thing is his like I, I feel cliche saying this is the narrow bridge quote where it's like life is a narrow bridge and the most important thing is to not be afraid but like that is so huge like that's like how do you not be afraid like when fear lives in your body and how can you really like breathe into the fear and face the fear and reconcile it and you know I was finding this really relevant the past week when I was in Israel and you know there's a war and I could hear bombs going off in Lebanon like all day and like my, I had my mother like hysterical on the phone like I, I had to block her for a day just because I was like mom like you're afraid like I'm not afraid right now like I can't even afford to be afraid I just have to like move through the day and it's just I don't know like at every point his Torah is just there's so much so yeah well um yeah, there's one one story thank you for all of that and all those teachings and making them personally embedded um there's a person who noticed that there were so many people that were coming to Rabbi Nachman and um eventually went to Rabbi Nachman himself and was like well why are all these people coming to you why are these people so enamored with you what are they what are they here to learn um and Rabbi Nachman said that um they come to learn how to breathe and so um my hope is that you and me and you know, maybe maybe every Jew in the world right now becomes a, a student of Rabbi Nachman in this way. We learn to breathe or maybe just breathe a little bit more easily. Um, but also, you know, in and out of our psychedelic experiences, um, learning the the tools and the techniques and the wisdom that can ground our experience into our body and deeper into our soul. Wow. Thanks, Madison. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi Zach. That last part was really beautifully articulated. Well, you 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 brought it out, and this is just the continuation of uh, a couple of years of of um, totally. in person and and online, and um, we're going to continue to do great work. Amen. Bezrat Hashem.